This is it guys, the all new second generation Mercedes-Benz GLC. It's based on the latest W206 C-Class, so it's got updated looks on the outside, an all new interior, a 48 volt mild hybrid engine, and vastly improved ride and handling package. It is a big upgrade compared to the old car, but I have to say that Mercedes-Benz Malaysia has done quite a few missteps in specking this car up for the local market. So should you still buy the new GLC over its closest rivals, the BMW X3 and the Volvo XC60? Let's find out in this review. Let's go. The best-selling model in Mercedes-Benz range has traditionally been either the E-Class or the C-Class sedan. But over the past couple of years, it has been this right here, the GLC SUV. In Malaysia, over 12,000 units have been sold since 2015. But across the entire globe, the number swells up to 2.6 million units. This goes to show it's not just Malaysia that is going on this SUV craze. The entire world is heading in the same direction as well. So despite this only being the second generation model or third if you consider the ugly GLK before that as well, this is now the most important model in Mercedes-Benz portfolio right now. But here in Malaysia, hitting the same sales numbers is going to be a tough ask because this new GLC is significantly more expensive than the old car. There is now just a single variant available, a GLC 300 4MATIC AMG line, and this goes for 430,000 ringgit. Not only is that a full 70,000 ringgit more than the old model, there is also no more of the more affordable GLC 200 base variant. Compared to its this is now between 55 to 75,000 ringgit more expensive over the BMW X3 30i and the Volvo XC60 T8 Ultimate. So Mercedes-Benz is really pricing this car at a huge premium over its closest rivals. Now, of course, at this level, the market is not super price sensitive, but we are still looking at a 15 to 20% difference over here. That is significant. Even within Mercedes-Benz's own range, the gap between a comparable C-Class and a GLC used to be around 60,000 ringgit. Now, it's over 100. Now, of course, we are talking about the fully imported CBU first batch models over here, but even the CKD version will be north of 400 grand. Now, on to looks. A lot of people have been saying that this car looks very similar to the old car, which I just cannot agree with. Now, perhaps I'm just too familiar with the whole Mercedes-Benz range, but to me, this looks completely different. It's based on the latest C-Class, so it does have similar styling cues, such as the slimmer headlights and this bigger, bolder grille with three-pointed stars scattered all over them. I think it looks pretty good. But at the same time, I do have to say the bottom part is looking a little a bit too busy, a little bit too fussy right now. So I think the older car looks slightly more handsome in comparison. Do you agree or disagree with me on this? Do let me know in the comments section below. As for the headlights, we do get a big upgrade over the C-Class which is saddled with the lower spec lights here in Malaysia. With the GLC, we are getting the top of the range digital light system which looks great with double projectors and at night, it's fantastic. It's easily one of the best LED lights in the market right now. Around the side, this car gets 20-inch AMG multi-spoke alloys, which I do quite like, but there are a few issues with it. Number one, despite being 20s, they just don't look all that big on this car. I think if anyone were to guess, they would guess 18s, 19s at most. And then as iconic as this design may be, it's getting a little bit tired now. I had the same exact design on my 2016 C-Class, so I think it's time for a big update. The wheel arches are in full body colour now and the rears even have a bit of a flat lip to fit the wider rear track. Now the old GLC had a square tyre setup of 255s all around. This new version has the same 255s at the front but wider 285s at the back. The tyres are Continental Eco Contact 6 rubber and unlike the old car, these are no longer run flats. 
The back here is where the GLC looks the most like the old car, but I still say it looks far more modern than before. The taillights taper in quite dramatically towards the centre, giving it a far more sporty look. And in detail, the lights do look a lot better than before. It has a really nice glow at night, and if you look up close, it's got the same three-pointed star pattern to match the front grille. But down here, however, I think, yeah, it's all kinds of wrong. I just think there's too much chrome down here. It doesn't match the rest of the car as much. And as you know, the exhaust tips are all fake. Now, Mercedes-Benz, can we stop this soon, please? So while the exterior of the new GLC may look a little bit too familiar to some people, on the inside is completely new, completely fresh. This is based on the latest W206 C-Class with a few key upgrades here and there and I think is a complete revelation. The old GLC when it first came out had the best interior by far but even that is made to look completely ancient by this new layout. At the top you've got this digital instrument cluster without a hood and this is bigger and much more customizable compared to before. The center party piece is this big portrait touchscreen which looks good is easy to use and it also has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Plus, it also has one of the best implementations of touchscreen icon controls which is always there even when the screen is completely turned off like that. I mean, I'm never going to be a fan of touchscreen icon controls but if you do have them, this is one of the best ways to do it. And then this GLC is also equipped with the Burmester 3D sound system which was sorely missed in the C300. Here it sounds fantastic, much better than in the older GLC. I think they've done quite a fair bit of software tuning to make this car sound a lot nicer than before. You've also got the super elaborate ambient lighting system on this car which is still by far and away the best in the business. BMW, Volvo don't even come close in this part. Build quality is also very very good, at least in what you can clearly see. The top half of the dashboard is finished in this Nepa look article leather. It looks like the real thing even up close. This is much nicer than the previous rougher leather used before. The aircon vents also feel very fluid, very expensive to use, much like an Audi. And even the bottom half of the dashboard is still using soft touch plastics. This is a big upgrade compared to the W206 C-Class where it gets all rough and hard down here. Over here, it's still nice soft touch without any sticking hard points. But at the same time, there is no escaping that this car is built within one of those Mercedes-Benz periodic cost-cutting cycles, so you do get a few cheaper parts here and there. The stocks behind the steering wheel have a really nasty cheap plastic finish and if you open up this center console over here, the inserts around there feel really cheap. Yeah, that does not sound like a Mercedes at all. You've also got this really cheap sounding loose button over here and even the steering wheel, as nice as it is to hold, the center boss has a bit of a cheap finishing on the plastic piece. So yes, while on the surface this has a fantastic interior, it doesn't really hold up to close scrutiny. I think in terms of build quality, both the X3 and the Volvo X60 is a hair better than this GLC. Now on to the practicality bits. The seats are absolutely fantastic. They are super supportive and they are adjustable in a multitude of ways. Even the headrest can be pushed forward and back like so. You've also got memory functions for both front seats, although they are only heated, not ventilated. Even the steering column is electrically adjustable like this, so this to me just screams premium much more so than both of its closest rivals. But the usual Mercedes-Benz annoyance is still present over here. The driver's footwell is just far too narrow, far too tight, and there is no proper footrest on the left side. That's just something that all Mercedes-Benz owners have to live with, I guess. As for the rear space, the new GLC is about the same as the old car. Despite this car having grown on the outside, even with a stretch wheelbase, rear legroom feels just about the same as the old car. I still think the BMW X3 is a bit more spacious in the back here. But having said that, this should be more than big enough for most people. I am 167cm tall and my legroom, headroom is more than enough. Even if you're much taller, you should be able to fit in the back here with no issues at all. 
The seat comfort is also pretty decent, although it does feel a little bit flat in the back here and you cannot adjust the backrest angle at all. But at least the seat squab is long enough, fairly comfortable for longer journeys. But here I will have to mention the Artico leather used on the seats over here look far cheaper than the ones used on the door carts. This has a very large rough grain on it and it looks even more obvious on this brown leather over here. As for features, well, there's not much to talk about. You do get this nice side window blinds and rear aircon vents, but that's pretty much it. You even lose out on the rear aircon controls that were fitted to the old GLC. And speaking of things that have been removed from the car, look up top, there is no sunroof. The much cheaper old GLC 300 was given a full panoramic glass roof, but this one, yeah, why though? One last thing, you can fold out this center armrest and pop this bit out. Now, this is supposed to be used as a tablet or a phone holder for rear passengers, but surprisingly, there are no USB charging ports in the back. You have to route it from the front, which is a bit weird, I guess. And then if you push this slightly in, out comes a pair of cup holders. Now, talk about over-engineering. One thing I don't like are these standard fit side steps on the GLC. Now, this car really isn't tall enough for you to need side step to get in and out. And then the design is just too narrow for it to be useful for anyone really. Plus, because it sticks out, it will just dirty your pants every time you get in or out. This is just bad design through and through, I think. The boot is now significantly larger than before and in fact is the biggest in the class at 620 litres. There's also a generous underfloor storage which houses the tyre repair kit and Mercedes's genius foldable basket. So in terms of load carrying practicality, the GLC is excellent. Alright, on the move with the 2023 Mercedes-Benz GLC 300 4Matic. The engine is yet another updated version of Mercedes-Benz's 2.0-litre 4-cylinder turbocharged engine, but here it's been up-tuned slightly, so it makes 258 PS and 400 Nm of torque. So that is the same power but 30 Nm more than the old GLC and it's a healthy 50 Nm more compared to its closest rival, the X330i. On paper, this GLC 300 goes from 0 to 100 in 6.2 seconds but I've timed it at 6.5 and from the seat of my pants, this feels slightly slower compared to the BMW X330i. Of course, you can't compare this against the XC60 Volvo T8 because that's one of those crazy powerful plug-in hybrids with like 600 Nm of torque and so on. But taken in isolation, this GLC 300 is more than powerful enough. This 2.0-litre 4-cylinder turbo is super smooth, very powerful and in sport mode, it even sounds decent as well. Yeah, that's not bad, is it? Now, most of that is artificial sound piped in through the speakers, but from the driver, I don't mind it. I think it sounds pretty cool. It's no six-cylinder, but as far as four cylinders go, this is one of the better engines out there. But I do say that the BMW X3, despite having a lot less torque, feels slightly quicker still. That is mostly to do with the transmission, I think. Despite this having 50 Newton meters more, the transmission, in this case, uh, Mercedes-Benz's own 9G Tronic Automatic, is still a step behind the class best, the BMW ZF8 Speeder. Now, this is actually an excellent transmission. It reacts well enough. It's smooth enough for most of the time, but there is a bit of that hesitancy from down low, especially going from gears one to two it feels a little bit clunky so if you're stuck in a very long jam you can feel that like the car is yeah jerking a little bit every now and then that is not ideal but once you get past the initial first to second shift it is pretty much excellent the shift logic is pretty good as well as you drive along it pretty much selects the ideal gears most of the time and even if you ask for a quick burst of speed like so it downshifts three four gears in a row and it just jumps forward very very quickly now helping that is the 48 volt mild hybrid system that is stacked onto the engine 
This is supposed to add an additional 23 PS and up to 200 Newton meters of torque to the wheels, but Mercedes-Benz has stopped short of just adding those numbers up onto the maximum power figures because that's not how it works. This belt starter generator or the BSG of this 48 volt mild hybrid system usually works at very low speeds at low RPMs. At that time, the engine is producing nowhere close to its peak powers. So adding the top peak figures together, that's really not how it works. At no point will this car feel like it has 600 Newton meters like the Volvo XC60 does. In any case, the 48 volt mild hybrid system just works cleanly, smoothly, seamlessly in the background as it should. At no point do you actually feel additional push, additional torque from the BSG system. It just feels like a very finely tuned 2 litre turbo engine. One thing that Mercedes-Benz has made a big improvement in is in terms of braking feel. Previous Mercedes-Benz hybrids were notorious for having really weird braking feel. This is one of the first hybrid Mercedes-Benz that I've driven to have fairly neutral, fairly normal feeling brake pedal. So that's a good thing, obviously. Now let's talk about the way this car drives. First thing you will notice is that despite this being an SUV, you don't really feel like you're sitting all that high in this car. If you were to blindfold me, get me inside, I would guess that we're driving a C-Class because this doesn't feel like a very commanding driving position at all. That's both good and bad obviously. The good is because you feel more connected to the car. It feels more car-like to drive and not like a clunky SUV. But the bad part is a lot of people are buying SUVs specifically to get that commanding driving position which this car doesn't really offer. From where I'm sitting, yeah, I think I'm just about the same height as like a MyV and so on. Plus, this A pillar from inside is really, really thick. It blocks a lot of your view out. So you do have to be a bit more careful when say coming out of a junction or perhaps maneuvering this car around tight parking lots. As for handling, this car is actually really, really good. It's a big improvement over the old GLC. Not to say the old GLC was bad in any way, but this just feels far flatter, far more dynamic than before. The old GLC managed to be fairly dynamic by having stiff suspension. With this new one, Mercedes-Benz has really rounded out the suspension game, so it feels both supple and dynamic at the same time. So if I were to take this corner right here, at very decent speeds, the car stays mostly flat and the traction is really really good. There's not too much body roll like before and yeah, this is a pretty enjoyable car to drive day in and day out including your, you know, runs up Gunting every now and then. If you need to buy just a single car to do your family runs as well as the Gunting runs, this is a pretty good one. Now, of course, it's not quite as dynamic as a BMW X3 still, but that's because this rides on your standard steel springs and dampers, while the BMW X3 is available with far more advanced adaptive suspension system. Now, of course, with adaptive dampers, you can adjust between comfort, sport, and so on, whereas with the Mercedes-Benz, you're stuck with a passive setup. This is what Mercedes-Benz has given a very fancy name, agility control suspension with selective damping. But by all intent and purposes, it is a passive setup. You cannot adjust it between comfort and sport and so on. In any case, this is still a big improvement over the old car. This is now far smoother, far more comfortable across all speeds now. It's only through very large or very sharp bumps that you can feel that the car feels a little bit under damped and it sends a bit of a shudder through the chassis. But by and large, this car's ride and handling is superb. It gets very close to the adaptive system in the BMW, despite being a passive system that is going to be much more affordable to maintain in the future. And then there's the refinement as well. I'm actually going at 100 kilometers per hour right now, but you cannot hear anything, can you? This car, in terms of isolating road noise and wind noise, it is superb, easily the best in the class at up to 130 kilometers per hour with the sound turned off. There's hardly any wind noise coming in and road noise is kept at an absolute minimum as well. This car 
is fantastic when it comes to refinement and that's no surprise because for once we are getting very high specs over here the windows are actually double glazed acoustic glass all around so that helps a lot in isolating the driver away from all the additional noise on the outside this is yeah like i said superb what's not so great is the active safety systems on this car so this matches what we have in the c-class so you've got seven airbags electronic stability control autonomous emergency braking a blind spot monitor and so on but that's about it there is no adaptive cruise control there is no active lane keep assist together with a level 2 semi-autonomous driving system yeah there's none of that so as usual mercedes-benz malaysia is still skimping on all these active safety features bmw malaysia is equally guilty as well but that's where volvo car malaysia comes in pretty much all cars that they are selling has all the features packed in as standard that just makes both mercedes-benz and bmw look bad look stingy when it comes to equipment i think and that is a real shame for mercedes-benz because in general it makes one of the best level 2 semi-autonomous driving features i've tried yet so that if included in the GLC, it would have made this car a much better package overall. Right now, take this car on a long distance highway run. Yeah, I keep looking for adaptive cruise control, which clearly it does not have. That's a big shame, I think. I've mentioned this over multiple videos from Mercedes-Benz, BMW videos and so on. And so far, nothing's changed yet. I hope they can do something about this very, very soon. Fingers crossed then. So that's my full review of the 2023 Mercedes-Benz GLC 300 here in Malaysia. Overall, this is a big step forward for the GLC. Perhaps not so much visually, but the all-new interior is absolutely top class. It makes the insides of the old GLC, the X3, X60 feel completely archaic in comparison. And then there's the way it drives and rides as well, which is far superior, far smoother than before plus the refinement, it is the class of the field by far right now. It's telling that despite this car running the steel, springs and dampers, it is a close match to the BMW X3's adaptive dampers in the way it drives and rides. Of course, it helps that both of its closest rivals are getting on a bit in terms of age, so this fresh new boy is an absolute standout right now. But at the same time, there is no denying that this is a very expensive car for what it is compared to the old car, compared to its key rivals, and that is made even more glaring with the fact that it's missing a few key features such as a sunroof and even adaptive cruise control. So all in all, while this is surely the best car in the class right now, it could have been better still and you do have to pay a steep premium for it. So what do you think of my review of the 2023 Mercedes-Benz GLC? Let me know in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and stay safe everyone.